morning, everyone. Thank you, Hilary. Um, so great to be speaking to you today. Um, we're, uh, my name is Sam Green. I'm a business engagement advisor at um, the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. Um, and I work in the International Data Unit with um, my colleague, Nigel. And uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, everyone. Well, it's early afternoon, isn't it? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I work in the uh, in the unit as uh, as uh, Sam says on data preparedness issues. Brilliant. I'll uh, just share my screen. Hopefully you're all able to see that. So I think today we're going to talk to you about um, personal data, um, using your personal data in the business at, at the end of the transition period. Um, so I'll pass over to Nigel to speak a little bit about the legal framework um, and GDPR. Yes, and thank, thanks very much, Sam. And uh, well, it's really uh, it's it's great to be talking to a uh, to a business audience in the uh, in in the UK. I miss this. Um, I uh, was a civil servant for a long time, and then uh, took a, a step out and come back into DCNS recently in this uh, in, in this uh, sort of post uh, post transition period or pre transition period, end of the transition period, uh, doing some work on data protection, and I think. You know what we're going to say this morning. Hopefully, is 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 very relevant to uh, to this audience in in particular. I'm not pretending that it's the uh, it's top of your list of priorities, uh, as the discussion on customs and other issues uh, show. There's lots of issues uh, remaining in terms of the end of the transition period, but this is one which uh, we think is 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 pretty important. So to start with the legal framework, well, uh, I expect both of you, uh, and it's very difficult in a, in, in a virtual setting to see you smile or grimace when I say the GDPR. So uh, I'm assuming that uh, many of you will know what it is. The General Data Protection Regulation is the uh, European Union uh, Data Protection Framework. It uh, came into force in May 2018 and essentially replaced the Data Protection Directive, uh, which had been enforced within the European Union since uh, 1995. Uh, the uh, regulation, uh, like the directive before hand, lays down certain requirements for the handling of uh, personal data, uh, both in terms of its processing, in terms of its storage, in terms of its security, and in terms of where it might be uh, transferred to uh, from, uh, from the country in which it's uh, processed in. Uh, personal data, of course, is, uh, as, you, as you well know, any information that can be used to identify a living person. There's endless debates on what is personal data or not, but it certainly includes names, addresses, and HR data, such as payroll details, IP addresses, and uh, various uh, other identifiers. Uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, of course, uh, uh, applied uh, to the uh, applies to the UK. Uh, the UK uh, as being one of the, uh, if you like, one of the supporters of the uh, GDPR. The UK government was very keen to see a, a regulation uh, uh, be introduced in the European Union, giving greater certainty on data protection issues. And uh, the GDPR is still in force at the moment, but at the end of the transition period, so 31st of December under current arrangements, it will cease to be applicable in the UK, and after the end of the transition period, uh, there'll be a new, uh, well, it'll be a retained in UK law uh, alongside the Data Protection Act of 2018. So essentially, you know, it, it, it's rolled over into in, into UK law. Uh, next uh, slide, if you could, Sam. Thanks. So. You might say, well, what's all this got to do with us? Uh, and it's a good question. Uh, so essentially, at the end of the transition period, uh, in, in terms of data adequacy and many other, in many other respects, the United Kingdom, of course, becomes a, 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 a third country. 
Uh, and so essentially, we become a, uh, on, in data protection terms, where we have the equivalence of any other third country outside of the European Union. And uh, as such, different arrangements apply to uh, the way the GDPR uh, uh, affects us. Uh, the European Commission, uh, under the GDPR, has the ability uh, to to assess countries for their adequacy. So a third country can be assessed uh, for their adequacy against the uh, in or in line with the data protection uh, with uh, in line with the general data protection regulation. So essentially, what this means is that a uh, a third country can apply as the UK have applied to be deemed adequate. And if they're deemed adequate in terms of their own data protection framework, then it means essentially that data flows can continue with that country as if they were a member of the European Union. So having a determination of adequacy is, is, is clearly of some significance in, in terms of data flows from the European Union, from the European uh, economic area into the, into the UK. And uh, indeed, uh, the European Commission uh, have deemed a number of countries to be adequate. And I'll put a, a, a list in the uh, in the chat later. Countries such as Argentina, Andorra, I remember those because they're at the beginning of the alphabet. But it includes uh, Canada, it includes New Zealand, Jersey, Guernsey, uh, Japan, and uh, a number of other countries. So these countries are being deemed adequate in that their legislation, their data protection framework is, is equivalent in some ways to the GDPR. Uh, and the UK, of course, uh, uh, because we adopted the GDPR into our UK legislation and that will continue uh, from the end of the transition period, uh, would expect to be also uh, deemed adequate. And thus, in pursuit of that, an application was made to the European Commission and the European Commission have been looking at the UK's case and discussing uh, the UK's case with the UK authorities now for over, uh, over six months. Uh, and as this, this penultimate bullet says, uh, the UK is working with the EU to secure adequacy uh, decisions. Now, in the absence of a determination of adequacy, businesses and organisations, of course, have to put in to place alternative transfer mechanisms uh, to keep the data flowing uh, from the European economic area. Now, we'll go into that in a bit more detail, Sam, we'll go into that in a bit more detail. But let me give you an update, because obviously you might say, well, that's very well, but, you know, tell us what the situation is now. We're not here in August, we're not here in September, we're not here in October. We're sitting here on the 10th of December, when the end of the transition period is the 31st of December. And we are well aware of that. Clearly. The uh, determination of adequacy, as I said, is 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 is, is, a, is, a, is if you like down to the European Commission. Effectively, they adopt a decision. This is a legal decision uh, that the UK is adequate. That's what we're expecting, and that legal decision is subject to an opinion from the European Data Protection Board. The European Data Protection Board, the grouping of 27 data protection authorities across the European Union, and an opinion is also uh, sought from the European Parliament. And uh, pursuant to those two opinions, the European Council then endorse uh, the decision adopted by the Commission and then adequacy is, is determined. And you might say, well, that is not going to happen before the end of uh, 31st of December, even if a, uh, a decision was adopted today by the European Commission. And, and that is, is, is probably true. So we're probably looking at some form of adequacy gap, uh, even if, as I said, a, a decision was adopted today or a decision was agreed uh, by the uh, European Commission and was acceptable uh, to the UK by the time it had been through this ratification process, we'd probably be into the into the new year. And thus discussions are ongoing uh, uh, on 
possible mechanisms, possible arrangements that could be put in place to manage this, this, this so-called gap. Uh, so that uh, legal uh, legal certainties could be uh, could be ensured for data transfers from the European Economic Area to the UK. So that's the that's the situation uh, we're in. Discussions with the uh, European Union on the data adequacy arrangements are split from free trade agreements. They're politically separate. The free trade agreements obviously are. Uh, a step above data adequacy in, 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 in terms of the overall process. Uh, but politically, uh, no doubt there is some linking, linking of them. Uh, we expect to receive the uh, positive data adequacy decisions from the European Union. And when I say decisions, there are two decisions. There's one under the GDPR and there's one under the Law Enforcement Directive, which is a parallel uh, uh, directive to the regulation dealing with certain types of, uh, certain types of uh, law enforcement uh, data. Uh, when we receive those decisions, of course, those decisions may, be, uh, may have certain... Uh, oops. I think Nigel might have been um, cut off there, um, but perhaps I'll pick up where he left off. Um, so just to reiterate what Nigel has been saying, um, if at the end of the transition period, um, the UK has not received data adequacy decisions um, or there is no solution that has been um, agreed uh, to kind of bridge that adequacy gap, as it were, um, then that free flow of personal data from the European Economic Area to the UK will end. And what that will mean in practice for, for, for organisations, for businesses, is that um, alternative transfer mechanisms will be required. Now, these are a, a set of um, uh, legal mechanisms which are outlined in the EU GDPR. Um, and they essentially um, provide a lawful basis for um, the transfer of personal data. So um, the most common mitigation and the most relevant mitigation for most organisations will be um, standard contractual clauses or SCCs. Um, but there are a range of others, including um, BCR, BCRs, which are binding corporate rules, um, and uh, there are some others. Um, so essentially, the, the, the risk for UK businesses, for UK organisations, is that if there are no adequacy decisions and these appropriate safeguards, these mechanisms are not in place. Um, and, and bear in mind that these, these legal mechanisms are um, between the UK organisation and the EA organisation who are transferring personal data. Um, then the EU organisation will be operating unlawfully um, and they could face regulatory action in that case. Now, to some extent, this will depend uh, the actual implications will depend on how European data protection um, authorities uh, view this, uh, this issue. Um, but there's a, a real risk that, um, you know, if regulatory bodies um, come down hard on European organisations, then they will, um, they will cease to send personal data to the, to the UK, to UK organisations, which um, could end up um, severely disrupting um, business functions. So, um, what businesses will need to do is, um, actually, before I, I launch into that, Nigel, I wonder whether you just want to um, pick up briefly where you left off. <laughs> well, no, I think, Sam, I'll let you continue. I do apologise. My, 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 uh, my screen went blank and I, I don't know what uh, happened. But I, but I think I'd, I'd covered most of, yeah, so please. Perfect. Thanks very much. So essentially what, what, what businesses will need to do is to map out their data flows with EU partners um, and work with those EU partners, those European Economic Area partners, um, to put in place those alternative transfer mechanisms. Um, now, the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the UK um, data regulatory authority, um, has put together some really helpful guidance um, on alternative transfer mechanisms, including um, an interactive tool that the organisations use um, 
to work out which particular standard contractual clause they may need um, in the certain situation um, for their, their respective data transfer. Um, so there's plenty of guidance on the ITO website and there's also guidance on the gov.uk website and we'll gladly um, share uh, a link to that um, later on. Um, just another note about um, standard contractual clauses. So just to provide a bit of context, um, standard contractual clauses, the current standard contractual clauses were um, created um, for GDPR and therefore there are a number of uh, loopholes or, or policy gaps really um, that the standard contractual, the current standard contractual clauses um, uh, you know, don't don't fully um, don't fully cover some scenarios for personal data transfers, and so for a long time the um, the commission have um, uh, have said that they are uh, going to publish some new standard contractual clauses which will um, be aligned with GDPR and therefore hopefully um, uh, cover and um, you know rectify a lot of those um, policy gaps in the previous standard contractual clauses. Now, recently, so on the 12th of November, um, the, the Commission published these draft standard contractual clauses, um, and these are currently um, undergoing consultation. Now, um, provision has been made in UK law uh, so that after, after the transition period, controls and processes can continue to use the transfer tools that they already have in place um, to, to transfer personal data. Um, and because we expect these new standard contractual clauses to be adopted after the transition period, um, they will not necessarily form a part of um, EU law retained in the UK. Now, if these SECs, these new SECs, are adopted in their current form, um, then it will repeal the existing SECs. Um, and much like uh, when the GDPR came into force, um, there will be a grace period to allow organisations to adjust their, their paperwork and, and make sure that they've got the relevant um, standard contractual clauses in place. Um, what that means is, um, whilst these standard contractual clauses are undergoing consultation and whilst they're still in development, the current standard contractual clauses remain a legal basis for, for personal data transfer um, and therefore organisations should continue to rely on them um, for any personal data transfers from the European Economic Area to um, the UK. Um, just another note on some recent guidance that has come out from um, the European Data Protection Board. Um, so uh, following the, the Schrems 2 case, which um, for those who don't know, is, uh, was a case taken up by um, Max Schrems, an Austrian privacy campaigner, um, and the result of which um, ended up invalidating um, the privacy shield, which had been um, one of the, the, the mechanisms used to um, provide a legal basis of personal data transfer between the e, e, European Economic Area and the US. The US. Um, but in this judgment, in the Schrems II judgment, they upheld SECs um, as a legal basis for transfer um, with the, the caveat that um, supplementary measures may be um, further supplementary measures may be required. Now, uh, the European Data Protection Board has now published this, this further guidance, um, and uh, this kind of ensures compliance with EU law following the Schrems 2 judgment. Um, essentially, what it calls for is for organisations to undertake a mini adequacy assessment themselves um, uh, when they're, they're um, putting through a, a personal data transfer. Um, but in practice, uh, the UK's independent um, data protection regulator, the ICO, is currently um, assessing um, and evaluating the, you know, what the implications of this guidance and further guidance will be available on the ICO um, in due course. Just a final thing to touch on from me is um, the withdrawal agreement. So um, there are a number of provisions in the withdrawal agreement um, pertaining to personal data. Um, and if adequacy decisions aren't in place, then these, um, these provisions will come into, into effect. Um, now, legacy data um, refers to um, personal data of individuals outside of the UK, which is processed in the UK um, prior to the end of the transition period, um, or subsequently on the basis of the, of the withdrawal agreement. Um, 
essentially will what organizations will need to do is just um, familiarize themselves familiarize yourselves with the provisions within the withdrawal agreement um, uh, to, to make sure that, that you're in a position to comply um, I know that there's there's colleagues in the, the wider team who are working on updated guidance um, concerning the withdrawal agreement so um, this will be uh, updated on gov.uk in due course um, as well so uh, in in terms of, of, of guidance uh, as I mentioned the gov.uk has has plenty of, of helpful guidance as well as the ICO the ICO also has um, uh, as well as the interactive SDC tool I mentioned there's a helpline um, that organizations can call um, you can speak to a, a business advisor who will be able to discuss with with you any concerns or technical questions that you may have um, regarding personal data transfers at the end of the transition period. Um, there's just one more uh, one more thing I wanted to know actually is that um, we are currently working with with colleagues to provide more um, tailored sector guidance. Um, and as a result, um, uh, and and uh, as part of that, we're quite keen to develop some case studies of um, uh, of organisations who've successfully implemented alternative transfer mechanisms and SECs. Um, so, if it's if uh, it's not too much of an ask, I'll, I'll circulate a um, a form. Um, and if there are any organisations who have implemented um, SECs or other alternative transfer mechanisms and are happy to um, to kind of uh, detail that that experience then that would be really appreciated on, on our side um, and i'll circulate that form um, later today um, but i think that's it from uh from me so i wonder um nigel if you have any more um to say before we move on to questions thank you sam i i, I don't think i've got a lot to say uh, and it you know, there's a lot of information uh, here that we've <coughs> gone over, and I'm sorry that we we can't be more certain about what's going to happen at the end of the uh, transition period. Uh, we could be in a finding of adequacy, we could be a finding of no adequacy, or we could have some sort of bridging mechanisms. We we don't know, but I think the the salient point that comes across in this, or should hopefully comes across from us, is that you need to be prepared for a non-adequacy uh, situation. I, I think. You know, anyone that watched the news last night or understands what's going on will uh, will see that this is a, a real possibility. Okay, looks like Nigel's having um, some more technical difficulties there. So, um, if we just um, pop on to some questions now, and if um, Sam, you could um, pick this up. Um, can I still send personal data unrestricted to countries in receipt of EU adequacy decisions after the end of the transition period? Thanks, Hilary. Um, so, so yes, the answer is that the UK has has legislated to um, to allow the continued um, transfer of personal data um, to EEA states, member states. Um, and those who have received a, an adequacy decision, um, that is on a on a kind of a transitional basis, um, and this will be kind of reviewed after a four year period. At which point, um, uh, you know, the, the new data protection re re regime that we have will, will evaluate um, and ensure that those decisions are still up to date. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, um, can you just define um, a little bit more clearly what legacy um, personal data is? People seem to be a little bit confused. We've had quite a few questions, basically all asking the same question. So um, if you can go into that in some detail, that'd be great. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, this is one, one of the sections which perhaps isn't as, um, as clear. Um, and this is why, partly why we're, we're currently undergoing, um, you know, updating the guidance for, for that. Um, and as I say, th there will be for the guidance in, in due course. Um, but essentially, legacy data, um, and Nigel, do jump in here, it's, it's personal data um, of individuals outside the UK that is processed in the UK. Um, so essentially, you know, you might have a, um, uh, d details of someone in Germany. Um, that data is then processed in the UK. And as part of the withdrawal agreement, um, that 
uh, essentially GDPR um, regulations will continue to apply to that um, to that data that is held of that of that individual in Germany. Um, and it's just a, a real safeguard, really, on the part of um, the EU to make sure that um, you know its citizens are, are protected and that the GDPR still um, extends to <coughs> citizens. Um, even though when um, the UK has an independent uh, data protection regime. Yeah, so let, I mean, let, let, let's give you a, you know, a, a simplistic scenario. And, uh, you know, in, in most cases, you know, the treatment of this data is going to be no different. But if you receive personal data on, on, on your German employees or, or whatever, before the end of the transition period, you're obliged, as you know, under the GDPR to enact certain types of security mechanisms to, to protect that data. If, if after a couple of years in the, in the new UK regime, if you, if you like, we enact different security arrangements to, to, to protect data, then, <coughs> then the, the, the information or, sorry, the, the protection of that previous data that you'd received about your German employees would have to be protected under the old uh, security regime rather than the new security regime. Now, you know, in most cases, you know, there's not going to be a difference. But, but this is what this legacy uh, data is, is, is about. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, I think the last question um, just now, um, unless more come in on the chat, because there was a lot about the legacy personal data. In fact, there were, there were, there were several on the same question, as I said. Um, do I need to appoint a European representative? And if I do, how do I find one? So on, on the so, European, sorry, go on, Nigel. No, like, I mean, all, all, I, all I was going to say is that this 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 question comes up. You you uh, there's the specific guidance on the ICO site, so I think it's it, it's best to, to to look there. There are certain circumstances where you need, or, or where where certainly the advice is is that you should uh, appoint a European represent a European Union representative, and, and certain certain scenarios where you know where, where, where you don't where you don't have to. But uh, so yeah, uh, if you look on the ICO side, yeah. Uh, if you also look at Article Twenty Seven of uh, the GDPR, there's um, you know it, it includes. Um, who will need to um, who will need to uh, appoint European representatives? Um, in lots of cases, uh, organisations will not need to to appoint a new representative if that processing is only occasional or low risk um, and does not come into the the special category or criminal offence uh, category. Um, Obviously, we can't um, we can't advise in terms of you know where to go um, to appoint one, um, but you know we recommend that, that businesses uh, take due diligence and, um, as Nigel points out, refer to the ICO website where there's a lot of information um, regarding um, an EU representative. Thank you. I think Aaron's got another question from the chat. Aaron, uh, just a final question, I believe, is uh, our business email addresses alone considered personal data? Well, yes, yes. I mean, a, 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 an email address is, 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 is personal. Yes, is, is, is generally considered to be, is generally considered to be personal data because it identifies a, identifies a person. I mean, not, not necessarily in all cases, but in, in, in general, I mean, if, if 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 the business address is is corporate at Siemens dot co dot uk or whatever, then it's obviously not a uh, an identifier. But if it's the name of an individual, then it's an identifier. Yeah. Have you anything to add, Sam, to that? No. Okay. Nigel's covered it really. Okay. Thank you very much, um, both um, Nigel and Sam, for um, going through the, the data issues that we're all going to be facing from January um, next year. Um, so um, we'll move on then um, to our final um, presentation, which comes from Stephen Kelly, who's the CEO of Manufacturing Northern Ireland, who is going to give us a whistle-stop tour of the complexities of trading with Northern Ireland. So um, quickly, over to you, Stephen, because I know there's a lot to get through.
Hilary, uh, Aaron and colleagues, thanks very much. Uh, as Hilary said, my name is Stephen Kelly. I'm Chief Executive of Manufacturing Northern Ireland. We're partners with Make UK here across uh, the Irish Sea in, in Northern Ireland. And we do very many things uh, very similar. And we certainly do lots of stuff together, particularly in regards to the issue of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol. So we'll quickly take you through uh, where we are. Uh, some people may know lots of this detail. I suspect many won't. Uh, so it's quite high level in terms of what is the protocol and what do you need to do to continue to trade goods into Northern Ireland. Basics first, the protocol was established as part of the UK and the EU's withdrawal agreement. And uh, it was negotiated back in October 2019 and ratified by both the UK and the EU parliaments at the end of January and beginning of February uh, of this year. That began the 11 month transition period, which were three weeks from ending at the moment. The purpose of the protocol was essentially to do three things. One was to ensure that there was no return to any physical border infrastructure on the island of Ireland, to protect the all island economy and to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And essentially the protocol establishes uh, a brand new status for goods that are being traded into Northern Ireland and uh, from Great Britain. Uh, it is not dependent on the current free trade negotiations that uh, are on a knife edge at the moment. Uh, and things are different for Northern Ireland and for trading to Northern Ireland, regardless of that free trade agreement being uh, agreed between the UK and the EU or not. So the first important point is that this is a, a status that will remain regardless of that free trade agreement or not. The protocol is governed by uh, a new committee called the, the Joint Committee. It's uh, supported by specialized committees and it's a living document uh, and changes will be, remade, will be made to resolve those issues as they're identified and potentially to improve the deal. So news earlier this week, uh, a statement from Michael Gove in Parliament yesterday outline some new agreement that the UK and the EU have arrived at in terms of uh, some issues with the protocol, some derogations that are required, particularly around uh, the movement of supermarket goods uh, and some other information which will become available probably from tomorrow, but certainly by Monday when the Joint Committee agree to, to formally adopt the proposals. What the protocol essentially means is that uniquely Northern Ireland goods uh, can freely circulate in the EU single market, uh, but it will be subject to single market rules and, v and VAT rules. Nowhere else in the UK, regardless of a deal or not, will have that status of being able to have their goods freely circulate within the EU's marketplace. Additionally, as a sovereign nation, the EU uh, has confirmed that the UK can provide unfettered access to Northern Ireland goods into the UK's internal market. So there will, will be no controls for the stuff that's made in Northern Ireland to go back into the rest of the UK. And there's free circulation of our goods within the EU. Northern Ireland remains part of the UK's custom territory. Uh, and what that means is that those free trade agreements that the government is negotiating, I think we're up to 56 at the moment, Northern Ireland will be uh, beneficiaries of those free trade agreements. And however, the UK will operate as an agent on behalf of the EU in terms of a customs border across the Irish Sea. So for goods traveling from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, there will be customs and plant and animal health procedures that the EU uh, will insist on as its external border, but the UK will operate on behalf of the EU. <coughs> So what all this means in summary is that uniquely Northern Irish goods will have tariff quota, rules of origin, and indeed customs free trade, both with the EU and the great British market. The checks and controls are in one direction only, which is from GB into Northern Ireland. And the cost of this uh, free trade for, for our goods with the EU and with the rest of the UK is those customs controls only in the Irish Sea from Britain into Northern Ireland. The thing to, to really stress is that this is a new status that comes from the 1st of January 2021. There's lots of reports of, uh, of grace periods, lots of reports of further periods to allow systems and processes to be implemented on the short straits between Dover and Cali. Uh, but this status comes into play 
on the 1st of January, just 22 days time. So uh, if you make goods in Great Britain and you're looking to place those goods on the, the Northern Ireland market, whether that's with uh, as a supplier or directly to consumers, uh, there's a number of things that you must know. Uh, the first thing to say is that because we're part of the EU single market, uh, all goods must continue to be manufactured to the relevant EU rules. And in many respects, uh, because an EU conformity marking is required, that means uh, that CE marking for most goods will continue to be required. So if you sell goods anywhere in the EU currently and you plan to do that after the 1st of January 2021, then the same rules will apply to Northern Ireland in terms of conformity assessments and ensuring that your goods meet those EU standards. What it means is that if you use a UK conformity assessment provider, uh, then uh, you also have to include not just a CE marking, but a new UK NI marking. So many on the call will be familiar with the new UK CA conformity assessment marking. Uh, that cannot be used in Northern Ireland. So if you intend to send goods to Northern Ireland, uh, you have to use the CE mark. And if you use a UK body to provide you with those conformity assessments, then you need also to have the UK NI marking. What it does mean for us in Northern Ireland is that we only need one set of marking. So if we have uh, the CE marking, which we're, in, we're required to do, that because of the unfettered access rules, that means that our goods can freely circulate in the rest of the UK marketplace. We only require that CE marking if you make stuff here in Northern Ireland and intend on selling it across in Great Britain. So how do you get goods to Northern Ireland? So from a, a Great Britain to a Northern Ireland direction, there's a number of things which people will be very familiar of, uh, particularly if they're selling uh, to other markets. So you do need those descriptions and commodity codes, the consigner and consignee, as we heard in our earlier presentations, the type and amount of packaging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to that, uh, if you're uh, selling foods or particularly goods of animal origin, all those goods will have to enter Northern Ireland through a border control post where they'll be subjected to uh, SPS checks by uh, a vet from our local agricultural department. So the, the, the goods will arrive at a port in Britain. Uh, they will be per permitted to enter the boat and travel across. But if your goods uh, require SPS checks, then those will have to enter Northern Ireland through those border control posts. In terms of goods from EU into Northern Ireland, then essentially there's no change. So from the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland, just free trade and travel uh, as we do today. If we bring stuff from the EU to Northern Ireland via Great Britain, then those uh, travel through the, the transit arrangements, uh, some of which were mentioned earlier. And indeed, if goods are sent to uh, the EU uh, to Northern Ireland, uh, exit in GB because they've already cleared customs at that point when they've, in, when they've entered GB, there's no change there as well. And as mentioned earlier, if we're selling either to GB or to the EU, there's no change from the current arrangements. It's really important if people haven't already engaged with them, but I know most manufacturers have, that, that they understand the, the INCO terms. So if you're selling to a Northern Ireland customer, I uh, agree with them in advance what those INCO terms will be so that it's clear who has the responsibility for any customs administration, uh, any tariffs, uh, should uh, relationships completely break down, uh, and it's clear uh, to the customs authorities whose responsibility it is. The goods vehicle movement systems briefly mentioned earlier, I'm not going to, to detail in terms of this slide because we know the slides are, are going to be shared afterwards. And at the bottom of the slide, there's actually uh, a YouTube link to a HMRC webinar, uh, which talks about the, the goods vehicle movement system. But same principle applies. If you're currently selling to any other part of the EU and you wish to continue to sell into Northern Ireland, then you'll have to go through the, the GVMS system load on the information uh, and ensure that all that information is there whenever the vehicle arrives at check-in at the ferry port in Scotland or in England. So some things you really should do. Uh, the first thing is 
as part of the UK's commitment to ensure that trade continues to flow freely through, uh, throughout the UK, they've established what's called the Trader Support Service. Uh, this is a £355 million service as part of the Northern Ireland Protocol, as part of the UK's commitment to support businesses in GB and in Northern Ireland to ensure that uh, trade between Northern Ireland and GB remains as frictionless as possible. Uh, that service is there uh, to provide essentially two things. One is there's a training element. So when you register, you become part of their training academy. So the latest news and information, which is relevant for trading to Northern Ireland and indeed relevant for trading with the, the European Union will be available to you. And secondly, they're there to support the completion of all the customs requirements and documentation. So if you're moving anything from GB to NI, uh, regardless of whose responsibility it is, whether it's the importer here in Northern Ireland or whether it's you as the exporter from the rest of the UK, uh, you should sign up for the Trader Support Service. It's free, it's a source of good information, but it's also a source of practical support where they'll be able to assist businesses uh, to ensure that that trade continues to flow as smoothly as possible. The second thing is an, an EORI number. And if you wish to continue to trade with the EU, you will have one of these. Uh, you should certainly register for those. And indeed, if you register with the Trader Support Service between now and the end of this week, uh, you'll automatically be enrolled in that. Northern Ireland businesses uh, will have a separate identifier. So we'll have an XI EORI number. And if you're sending goods across, then you should make sure uh, that your customer here in Northern Ireland provides you with that XI EORI number. As of yesterday, there was something in the region of 19,000 UK businesses registered with the Trader Support Service. And uh, the vast majority of those were businesses in Great Britain who continue to sell into Northern Ireland. So the TSS and this EORI number are critical elements and simple and free elements that you should engage with today. Next thing is, do your goods meet the EU standard? Uh, we all currently meet those standards because we're all part of the EU single market. Because Northern Ireland, uh, as a territory, will have to in, uh, ensure that goods here meet those EU standards, then you need to ensure, if you're sending stuff, that you keep aware of what those EU standards are and you ensure that uh, your goods meet those standards if you wish to send them across to Northern Ireland. Your haulier is going to be a critically important partner for you. Uh, Whenever the, the vehicle arrives at one of the GB ports uh, en route to Northern Ireland, or indeed when it arrives at a GB port en route to Dublin port as an important uh, transit route to Northern Ireland, uh, they need to make sure that all the information is ready and that the detail is loaded onto the goods vehicle movement system. So whatever haulier you're using at the moment, whether that's an external haulier or whether you're doing uh, your own movement of goods, uh, you should really ensure uh, that you understand the processes, talk to your customers and understand your own data that's required. So that that's loaded up onto the system. And when the, the vehicle arrives up to two hours before the sailing, uh, that all those details are, are ready and correct. And that when you check in, you're able to uh, board the ferry and travel. And lastly, uh, just in summary, uh, the protocol brings very many complications, but it brings quite considerable opportunity for Northern Ireland. Uh, we are uniquely, regardless of what happens in the next, over this next weekend or between now and the end of this year, we will uniquely be able to have tariff quota and customs free access to both the Great British market and the EU market. So as a last pitch, if you're interested in a production facility, which enjoys that status, you're free to give me a call. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. We've got quite a few questions, so we'll um, jump onto them just now. Um, so will goods moving from the EU to NI, go through, which go through, through Great Britain, need to follow common transit rules, including the authorised consignor or consignee status? Yes, they do. And, and the Trader Support Service, which I mentioned, can assist you to ensure that that continues to flow freely. But yes, uh, it won't require the full customs rigmarole, but it can operate through those transit systems. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, next question. When is the UK NI marking mandatory? It'll be mandatory from the 1st of January. 
Um, next question. Um, I understand there's an additional EORI number companies require to be able to send um, goods into Northern Ireland, beginning with XI. Are you able to tell us how we can apply for this? Because we've not been able to find it anywhere. So, as I mentioned in the presentation, if people register today and before the end of this week with the Trader Support Service, and the URL is on the, the presentation that I shared, but if you Google Trader Support Service, it'll it'll come, uh, it'll bring up those details. Uh, you will be auto-enrolled into that system. Uh, Northern Irish firms need that XI EORI. Mm -hmm. firms that continue to want to trade with the EU, including Northern Ireland, will just need their own EORI number. But if you register through that Trader Support Service, they will look after all that registration process for you. Super. Just one thing, Aaron, before you move on to the next question, as a sort of a quick follow up to that, there's another question come through saying, so the, the free Trader Support Service is available to all traders moving goods between GB and Northern Ireland and um, those who import goods into Northern Ireland. If I sign up with them, does that mean I don't have to do anything? They'll do it all for me? No, you, you will still be required to ensure that uh, all the information is available and present and correct and that it's there. So when your vehicle arrives or your logistics firm's vehicle arrives to check in that the Stena line or P&O uh, or any of the other services, uh, that that's present and correct at that moment in time. The Trader Support Service will guide you through that process. It will, it will uh, create a number of the digital documents that you require, uh, but you have a responsibility to upload the information first. Uh, there is a bulk load upload opportunity. So there's an API, as they call it, to allow you to, to put in lots of data at the single point in time. But they'll essentially hold a digital wallet on your behalf containing all this information. And that information now will be shared across all the digital platforms that will be required to run those customs processes. So they do a bulk of the work um, for you, but you'll have to provide the actual information that feeds into the sort of into the structure. Absolutely. We we uh, I'll share after the the event. I'll share uh, a webinar that we have uh, undertaken with the TSS, including their slides and quite considerable Q and A answers as well. So Hilary and, and Aaron, if you're you're content alongside my presentation, I'll send you more information uh, and more links to that stuff that will uh, be useful to, to people. That'd be really helpful because there's quite a few questions basically asking the same question, like how much will the Trader Support Service do for me because we haven't really started yet. So that'd be really handy. Thank you. It's just important to say the, the Trader Support Service won't go live until the 21st of December. And the period between now and then is been used for, for three purposes, I suppose. One is to get people registered with the system. The second is for those people that are registered to begin to upload their data, that master data that's important for them to be able to create uh, the, 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 the documents, et cetera, for you. And then the third thing uh, is that people can get trained and understand the, the processes that are required and those processes that are required will be useful, not just on the IRC, but be useful for businesses. And that information will be useful for businesses selling anywhere in the EU or bringing stuff in from the EU. Thanks very much. Aaron, next question. Next question. Um, will a GB-based company be able to complete an import declaration for goods they are shipping to Northern Ireland, even if they are not established in Northern Ireland? I. Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, the, it, it depends on the circumstances. I mean, it sounds to me almost like they may be selling directly to consumers or whatever. And in that case, absolutely. This isn't dependent on a Northern Irish qualifying company status. You don't, uh, for this purposes, you don't need to be. That really becomes an issue on uh, things going the opposite direction at some point in 2021. So at, at the moment, uh, there's no qualifying status for what is a Northern Irish company. So anybody bringing stuff through Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK uh, is entitled to that unfettered access. But at some point in 2021, HMRC, the UK government, will define what is a Northern Irish company. And at that point, only those companies will be able to benefit from that unfettered access. So why, why are they doing that? Uh, at this point in time and for the first few months of next year, 
there is a, a potential risk, particularly in a no deal scenario where uh, an Irish company, a Southern Irish company or another European company could just bring stuff through Northern Ireland and enter into Great Britain uh, without any checks or controls. And that means that they've essentially got tariff free access uh, into there. Now, it's a pretty difficult process to bring stuff from continental Europe, get it across into Ireland, get it up to Northern Ireland, bring it across into GB. The cost and complexity of that is, is quite large. Uh, but there is a risk of fraud and tariff avoidance at that point in time. So the UK government will be bringing in uh, a qualifying status for Northern Irish businesses so that they can continue to enjoy that unfettered access into the rest of the UK. Now, we understand that's going to be pretty light touch. It'll be based on, uh, on, uh, on having premises and having people and uh, having a, a tax address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in here. Um, and behind the door uh, auditing of that process rather than coming and visiting and presenting documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at this point in time, there's no qualifying status for unfettered from, G from Northern Ireland into GB. Uh, and those GB companies who are sending stuff to Northern Ireland can complete all these customs formalities in advance. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so another one here. Um, how are goods deemed at risk of onward movement into the EU actually identified? So obviously they'll be um, subject to um, EU duties. So though the Joint Committee agreement this week, uh, the details of that have yet to be published. So there was some media commentary about it. Uh, the Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove, yesterday made a statement in the House, but the agreement that the UK and EU made at the Joint Committee uh, earlier this week has still to go through the EU processes of being approved. Uh, that will be finally approved by Monday uh, at the latest, but probably from tomorrow we'll be, we will begin to see some of the detail of that. Uh, at risk will largely be, uh, our, our understanding at this point in time, is that at risk won't be based on a, a tariff differential. It won't be based on a, a floor or a ceiling in terms of differences in tariffs. Uh, it'll be based on, on other criteria as well. Uh, the UK's interpretation of it uh, is that at, at maximum 2% of goods that arrive into Northern Ireland may be viewed as being at risk. So the vast bulk, 98% of stuff, uh, will be viewed uh, not being at risk. Uh, even those goods that are at risk, the UK is also committed that if there's any tariff to be paid, that that tariff will be reimbursed by the UK government themselves. So in, in effect, uh, trade with Northern Ireland will continue tariff-free regardless of the outcome uh, come uh, the, the 1st of January onwards. Thanks for that, Stephen. Aaron, next question. Uh, next question. Do we continue to charge VAT on goods supplied into Northern Ireland? Yeah, the, the Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK's VAT regime and H HMRC will administer that regime. So the, the, the type of trade that you do at the moment will continue as it does in the future. There are VAT complications for Northern Irish companies, but those are largely around access to EU VAT systems, which allow us to recover the VAT on, a, on, a, a, on an easier basis than the rest of the UK. Thank you. Um, if customers are returning goods from Northern Ireland to GB, do they need to have an XIURI number to do this? No. So if, if you sell something to uh, from GB into Northern Ireland and it's been returned, that travels unfettered. So there's no customs controls at that point. Thank you. Will couriers be using a different country coding uh, for Northern Ireland? Not that we're aware of, no. Thank you. Um, if goods are sold from GB to Northern Ireland, but then those goods are re-exported to the EU by the NI company, is any duty payable GB to NI? I no is the short answer. <laughs> I, I, until we see the detail of what's been agreed with the uh, joint committee this week, uh, it, there could be issues in and around origin at that point, but 
uh, our understanding is that no, there aren't. So it, it's only it's only if goods are being moved to Northern Ireland and are essentially being warehoused and dispatched uh, as as almost like retail that there becomes an issue at that point. But when you're bringing them across, there's a process being applied to them by a Northern Irish firm, and that's then being sold on to Ireland uh, or anywhere in the EU, then none of that applies. Next question. Uh, even when INCO terms have been agreed with a Northern Ireland customer, can or will the GB supplier still be held responsible for any tariffs if the goods are forwarded to the Republic? So the importer into Northern Ireland is, has the ultimate responsibility for importing the goods. So if you agree in good terms uh, that ensures that that responsibility is here in Northern Ireland, then there's no, there's no danger for the GB firm. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Um, I actually think that is it in terms of questions. There were lots and lots on um, the VAT stuff that you've answered already and loads on the um, Trader Support Service. So. I'm sure there'll be um, many others, and a couple of people have asked how they can contact you. So um, I'm sure that after the um, webinar, we can make sure we put um, some sort of contact, Stephen, um, that you, know, you can get in touch with him directly. Um, so I'm sure there are lots more questions to ask in the coming weeks. So really, it just remains for me to thank all of our speakers today for their extremely helpful and insightful presentations. Um, Next Friday, we have our final roadshow in this series, um, which will be covering customs declarations and also um, product labelling. Um, my colleague Aaron is now going to post a joining link in the chat box. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Bye bye.